one. Hi everyone, welcome to this very special Carnegie Hall live stream event. I'm Sarah Willis and I play the French horn in the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra and how I wish I was in Carnegie Hall in New York right now, but I'm in my apartment in Berlin. I just got back from a rehearsal with the Berlin Philharmonic. Yes, we're playing again, which is really great news. Um, and this is the way things are done right now um, on the internet. I would love to be there, but we're here and, um, but I'm still so so happy to be with all of you. I know many of you are watching on the Carnegie Hall Facebook page, on my Facebook page, on the National Youth Orchestra of America Facebook page, and on YouTube. So what we would love is we would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions about today's stream, I'm going to explain what it's all about in a minute. Um, do write in. If you just want to let us know where you're watching from, we'd love that as well. I love all this globalness of, of be, knowing that you're all out there. Let us know where you're watching from. If you have any questions, we'll be taking some questions between the videos. So what we're doing today, this is a new series of uh, live stream events by Carnegie Hall. And we today we are featuring three brass masterclasses, which were organized in, in past years by the Weill Music Institute. We have two masterclasses with members of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, the first one is with Hans-Peter Schuh, trumpet player. And the second one is with Dietmar Kerbelböck. That's difficult to say, you try that, Kerbelböck. <laughs> I hope I said that right, Dietmar, if you're watching. And um, the last video we have today is a masterclass which I gave at Carnegie Hall quite a few years ago in 2015. Um, so we're starting off with the trumpet masterclass, which is Hans-Peter Schuh, as I said, and Shane O'Brien, um, who was then in the Nat National Youth Orchestra of America, will be playing the solo from Petrushka, um, the ballerina solo. I know you all know it. Um, the one that starts with brum, da -da -dum, da -da -dum. Um, uh, and we hear it in all trumpet auditions. So I'm really interested to hear now how Shane is going to play it and to, to hear what Hans-Peter has to say about it. So we hope you enjoy this excerpt and please write in, let us know where you're watching from, who you are, and if you have any questions. And I'll see you back here right after this excerpt. <laughs> Three notes. Ba -ba -ba. Uh -huh. da -da 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 -da. Yeah. And then you can make a little difference uh, between mezzo forte and piano a little. Uh -huh. You know? No, okay, 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 okay. Let's sort the things. Yeah, you play uh, if ta ta tam is okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. From a tank. Ta ta ting, ta ta ta. Right. Ta ta ting, pa ta tam, pa ta ting, pa ta ta. The same. Ta ta ting, pa ta tam, pa ta ting, pa ta ta. Little, little, little. Solo. What is that? What is that? Yeah. Sorry. Go slow, slow, slow. Very easy. I take it one time. 
Mm -hmm. you, you, you know the piece, right? This is starting, and then there's a drum coming. Yeah? This is for the three parts, yeah? yeah? I take a brief, the three parts. I need, I need air. I can, can breathe. Mm -hmm. But from the idea, is, it's good. Take one time. Ta -ti -ta. Ta -ti -ta. It is, it's you play. Ta -ta -ta. Yeah, yeah. Pa -pa. Mm -hmm. pa -pa. Pa -pa. yeah. <laughs> Also a problem if you had too much here, yeah, yeah. too much, and here you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. And also after uh, you play the words, hmm? take it easy, take uh -huh. it down, take it down. Hmm? It's, I think it's very simple. It, the, the people are complicated. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. the, yeah, I'm sure it's good. Yeah. You play uh, the beginning. You play. Ta -ta -dim, ta -dam, ta -ta -dim, ta -ta -dim. It's okay. It's for me. Start. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And when here you play. Ta -da -di, ta -da -da, ta -da -di, ta -da. Why? It's a different style. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I think one style. And slow, slow, slow. Yeah. Okay, good. One, okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Clap, clap, clap. You heard a bit of clapping there. That was for Shane O'Brien playing this trumpet solo from Petrushka and coached there by Hans-Peter Schuh of the Vienna Philharmonic. I love his English accent, don't you? <laughs> I thought Shane played really well. What did you think? If you just joined us, I'm Sarah Willis from the Berlin Philharmonic and I am hosting a special live stream event by Carnegie Hall and we are looking at orchestral brass today and we're featuring some videos of masterclasses which have been put on at Carnegie Hall in the past and you just watched one about a trumpet or a little clip of one. Um, I think there's some more clips of that on YouTube um, of that special masterclass but that was just all about the trumpet and I just wanted to share something with you if you're any trumpet players out there. Um, you'll know who Gabor Tarkovi is. He was our principal trumpet at the Berlin Philharmonic for a long time. And he told me that his secret of playing Petrushka was to think of the Radetzky march beforehand. And this is not in a concert, because in a concert it's easy because you have drum, da, da, dum, you have that going. But in an audition, there's a deathly silence before you start to play. And he said he uses this trick to get himself in the mood for playing it in an audition. So he said what he did was imagine the Radetzky march. And I thought that was such an amazing tip. And if I ever get to play that on the trumpet, I will use it. <laughs> anyway, welcome. It's so fantastic. I'm seeing so much action going on here on the on the Facebook pages of of the Carnegie Hall of the National Youth Orchestra of America of my Facebook page. It's wonderful to see you. We have people watching from, I mean, literally all over the world. I, I saw in this few seconds, which I checked out the chat, Peru, Ghana, the UK, my mum is watching, um, Portugal, Spain, all over the States, Belgium, Paraguay, Bolivia. I mean, really incredible.
example. Um, keep it coming. We want to hear where you're watching from, what you play, what instruments you play, and if you have any technical questions for us. Now, I have um, the, the Carnegie Hall social team um, uh, looking at some of these questions. Um, there's a lot of, yeah, Turkey, Cyprus, Madrid, Poland, Italy, Uruguay, the Netherlands, Iceland, Greece. Greece. This is really amazing. We love this. So now all we need from you is a few questions. I have a question for you. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Anybody know? Anyone going to write it in the chat? I'll give you a hint. And yes, I bought this t-shirt at the Carnegie Hall gift shop. <laughs> I miss Carnegie Hall. I miss New York. I miss traveling. Um, I hope everybody's staying healthy out there. The Berlin Philharmonic was supposed to be at Carnegie Hall um, in November and uh, really looking forward to that with our new chief conductor, Kirill Petrenko. Sadly, of course, that's been canceled, but we'll be back. Um, and I can't wait for my next trip to New York. Um, but moving right along in our orchestral brass masterclass today, the second clip we have is for you trombone players out there. It is um, Dietmar Kubelböck. Have you all pr practiced pronouncing that? Kubelböck <laughs> from the Vienna Philharmonic, an amazing trombone player. And he is coaching, um, how do I pronounce his name? I hope it's right. Jacob Mezera, Metzera, I hope. Sorry, Jacob, if you're watching and that's not the right pronunciation. Um, but he's coaching him in a very famous trombone solo, the Tuba Mirum, where the bass stands up and sings about how wonderful the trombone is sounding. So you guys then have to sound wonderful. It's a great excerpt. Um, uh, I hope you enjoy it. Watch it, have a look, have a listen, and write any questions you may have in the chat, and we'll see if we can get to them. So enjoy. good and you you recognize what I want to say uh, this opposite uh, direction yeah when you think of that you you are on the secure side you, you, you will you won't fail it yeah it will work for sure let's do it immediately again okay and yeah Yeah, uh, maybe you can, uh, I mean, it's like a fanfare, kind of fanfare, yeah? It's a, this is the, the, the high court, uh, courtyard there in, in, in heaven, yeah? And you are the, the guy who, when, when the, uh, the judge is arriving, you are the guy who says, stand up, please, get up, yeah? Quiet, sit down, okay? This is the meaning of the, of the beginning. Very serious. Technically, very good. Now you take a little bit more time, so that uh, sometimes we have, I have a little bit the feeling that you want to get it behind you, yeah? 
uh, don't do that. Enjoy it and ha take your time every time you want to, to have. Yeah? Then, then there is the feeling that everything is, uh, it's, it's coming. Yeah? Um, Why not? From E flat? Another round of applause, please, for Jake playing there for Dietmar Kurbebock of the Vienna Philharmonic in Carnegie's Hall Masterclass run by the Weil Institute, uh, Music Institute. And that was back in 2018. And uh, I wonder what Jake's doing now. Um, if you're watching, write in and tell us. Um, yeah, it was great to see that. And uh, I love the Mozart Requiem. I actually sang it when I was at school. Um, it's really sad that there are no horns in it because, uh, yeah, that would be really nice. Actually, I think that solo would sound pretty good on a low horn. What do you guys think? <laughs> Um, if you've just joined us, welcome. I'm Sarah Willis from the Berlin Philharmonic and I'm really happy to be hosting this special live stream um, by Carnegie Hall. And we're talking about orchestral brass and we've had uh, a little excerpt of a masterclass done by Hans-Peter Schuh of the Vienna Philharmonic. And we just heard um, the Tuba Mirum um, from the Mozart Requiem uh, taught or explained by uh, Dietmar Kuberbuck. And we've had some questions, what I've been loving about seeing all the chats going on. I haven't had very many minutes to look at it. I will go back after this is finished and make sure I see who everybody who was watching. We love to hear where you're watching from and also what you play. There's so many people writing in to say that Jay Lee plays the trumpet, alto sax, ukulele and the, cajon, ukulele and the cajon. Impressive. We've got lots of horn players work watching. Nicole is a K8 music teacher, flute player. Um, yeah, this is great. And a lot of you got the answer to my question. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Um, it's really true, you know, we were filming something in New York recent, uh, a few times ago I was there and uh, we went down to Times Square and I really wanted to get someone on camera saying that. And the first person we asked was a policewoman and we said, excuse me, ma'am, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? We, we thought she'd tell us to get away with our cameras, but she said, practice, practice, practice. So I was very happy about that. So it is obviously um, something which everybody knows. <laughs> Anyway, so we had a couple of questions. I know we've just heard a, a, a trombone masterclass, but just going back quickly to the trumpets, we had um, Tom from the UK asked if classical trumpet playing is more technical than jazz trumpet playing. And I'm not a trumpet player, but um, I know many classical trumpet players and many jazz players. And I, I, I want to just remind you of Winter Marsalis, one of the greats, who told me he practices just as much as now as when he was playing, um, he, he, when he was playing classical concertos when he was college. He, you have to practice. All the guys in in his band, jazz at Lincoln Center, all the trumpet players, they do their warm ups, they do their long tones. They they don't call it practice; they call it shedding, um, which is something I learned from them. But the jazz players, the really good jazz players, you can't do without technique. You can never do without technique on a brass player. So it doesn't matter if you're a classical player or a jazz player, you have to put the hours in and do that practice, that shedding. Um, so that would be my answer to that question. Judy asked, is there an advantage of playing the trumpets with the keys, with the keys or the, the pistons or the valves? Now, um, I think what you mean by that is that the German trumpet system are the, the ones with the, with the valves here on the side or this. Hang on, which hand? Anyway, uh, <laughs> long time since I played a trumpet. And the American trumpets are the ones with the, with the piston valves on the top. I don't think there's, there's particular advantages. It just depends where you play. But I know that the guys in my orchestra, um, you have to play on a German trumpet, on a rotary trumpet. 
Um, but there are some pieces like if West Side Story comes or something like that with really sort of high jazzy solos, they will sometimes change to the, to the, to the piston valve instruments. So I don't really know what I'm talking about. I'm just trying to help. <laughs> <laughs> um, any trumpet players out there? Maybe you can answer these questions for us as well or, or give us your opinions because it would be really great. Um, so there's a, oh, that's very nice. We had a lovely comment um, on my Facebook page saying thank you in these difficult times um, to, to all of us, to, to, to me, to the Carnegie Hall, to all the musicians um, and to, for sharing this magical synthesis of many instruments and forms. This is hope. Um, this is hope for the music world and a better civilization. So thank you for that. Um, I don't know who wrote that, but I'm going to find out. It's really important to feel connected in this time. Um, that's why I'm so grateful for Carnegie Hall for putting on this, uh, this lovely live stream and asking me to host it. I'm very, very honored. Um, as I said at the beginning, I wish I was in New York with all of you. Um, but all of you are with me in my living room in Berlin. So welcome. <laughs> We've had trumpet and we've had trombone, and now we're going on to a masterclass, which has to be horn, right? We've got to do something for the horns. Now, last time I gave a masterclass at Carnegie Hall was actually quite a long time ago in 2015, but I remember it very well. Um, we talked about the Eroica Symphony, the very famous trio for three horns um in the third movement and i gave a great horn player who was then in the national youth orchestra of, of america called jack mccammon i gave him quite a hard time about opening his hand making a better sound better technique um i'd like to know what you think of this clip uh i think playing with us was michael stevens and mark trotter and everyone did a great job i think i gave him quite a hard time maybe i should have been nicer but you know you, they want to be the best. And, uh, and afterwards, I have a little surprise for you. So have a look at this, this clip of a masterclass that I did in 2015. Write in the chat. Let us know what you think, if you have any questions, and uh, what you think of the playing. See you right back after this. <laughs> That was pretty good. I think I might give him a job. Really, very, very good. I mean, I've heard that a lot worse, believe me. I've also played it a lot worse, probably. Um, a few things. You, what I like is that you're playing with a quite an open hand position. The hand is the most under underused and underrated uh, tool we have. You can do so much because if you go, if you go, well, here we go. Hold on. That doesn't really work, but. What they can see what I'm doing here is I'm just opening that up for the bottom. You were doing that already quite, quite well. You could, these little, da da da. When you go down, go da 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 da. Try opening up just a little bit more. I'm going to listen from here. Okay, I hear it is a little bit bum bum, and also the bum bum. Mahler would have loved that, and Bruckner would have loved that too. But it's not very Beethoven-y, yeah. It's a little bit huge. It should be loud, but but it, it depends on what your first horn is doing. If your first horn's playing it like that, then I guess you've got to play it like that. But the conductor won't let that happen for very long. <laughs> Okay, and there is a crescendo. Can you two just play it together? Or play oh, all three of you, why not? <laughs> okay, okay, it, it, it immediately becomes 
becomes just part of a, of a section. Um, but you have to play it on your own in an audition, and that's a bit of a pain. And um, when I was, I used to play the opera before I was in this orchestra, and Baron Boim was, was my boss, and he terrified because he'd go, Sarah, no, I want it da 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 And he would really sort of say, I want it like this. And he loved those two notes. And so you hear these two notes so rarely, and just, just now it was hard to hear it. So well, even when you're playing it on your own, you want to show, I know that these two notes need to be brought up. da 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 Okay, once more, with, the, with everything, no, without you guys, with the crescendo, there is a crescendo. Okay? Okay, and also, it's, it's a little bit, I hear... It, there, there are staccato, there's staccato, but there's nothing on that, but it, it, tradition, it, it's not... That's a little bit sort of do 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 do. Yeah, make it a little a little bit shorter, and also the more the, the take more care about the sound because it, it it it's very easy to make it sound. A little bit really sort of. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. Okay, another rhythm. I'm being really picky here because you're good and it's worth being picky with, but these are the things that might lose you an audition if one little rhythm is not right, because everyone in the, in the panel is sitting there. Oh, the guy's got no rhythm, you know? It's brutal, it's a brutal world out there, and you guys have to be the best. That means perfect rhythm amongst three million other things. <laughs> Okay, can you manage to get that da 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 Practice it a little bit, a little bit uh, slower. Yeah. Are you doing single tongue or double? No. Yeah, me too. Slowly, it's really hard. Try it once. Just try dun dun ta ka da da. Yeah, and if you practice it in various stages of getting faster. Mm -hmm. Um, that it's it, it helps. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Should we take that once more, all of you, all together? So basically, the rule of Beethoven three is know what's going on. Make sure you hear that while you play it and keep that rhythm going. I think as a low horn player to open up the hand as you go down. Um, those little notes are really important, and make it make a beautiful sound. And do what the first horn does or not. But <laughs> try <laughs> um, in the orchestra, but in an audition, make sure you're hearing hearing the others. Yeah, otherwise it's easy. And welcome back. Um, that was Jack McMahon being coached by yours truly at Carnegie Hall 2015 in a special masterclass put on by the Wild Music Institute. And it was an honor to do that. And um, Ma uh, Jack was playing together with Michael Stevens and Mark Trotter, all from the National Youth Orchestra of America. It was, a, it was a really great pleasure. It's always fantastic to be at Carnegie Hall. And a question that's just come in from Ross in Brooklyn. Do I have a famous, favorite performance experience at Carnegie Hall? And, you know, of course, I'd like to answer. They were all amazing. But I'm, I do remember one incredibly special one. And that was after 9-11. We were literally there with the orchestra a few weeks later when the city still had that, that, that really awful smell about it. And... And it was just, it, we discussed a lot in the orchestra about whether, whether we were going to even go or not. And then we did want to go and we, we wanted to do this concert. And, uh, and it was very, very moving to be there because um, we'd done the rehearsal in the morning and then most of us had been down to ground zero to, yeah, just to pay our respects or to get as, as close as we could just to really sort of feel like... We wanted to pay our respects, and and then we came back in the evening, and the concert started with the with the national anthem, and a, a fireman came on and sang, 
And I remember thinking, how on earth am I going to play? Because as a horn player, as all of you brass players out there know, if your throat gets tight, you cannot play very well. And it was just very moving. And I was looking at all the New Yorkers in the audience and just thinking what New York had lost. And that, that was a really memorable performance for a very sad reason. But we've had some very, very happy performances there. Mahler second, and I had the choir right behind me, um, literally singing or maybe even spitting into my hair. We wouldn't be allowed to do that these days, would we? <laughs> um, so poor old singers, they're going to have to wait a while before they, we can do Mahler, Mahler two all together again. But it's going to happen, I promise. One day we'll be playing all these wonderful pieces again. And um, my orchestra will be back at Carnegie Hall, I hope, before too long. So if you've just joined us on Facebook or on YouTube Live, I'm Sarah Willis from the Berlin Philharmonic, and I'm really happy to be hosting this special live stream event put on by Carnegie Hall and featuring past masterclasses about orchestral brass. Now we've been we've been looking at your question, and um, and there there've been there've been quite a lot of personal ones coming in, which I, I will try and answer later. Um, online in, in the chat and answering you directly. But uh, um, for example, there was a good one from Vincent from Connecticut wondering what why I decided to specialize as a low horn play, player. Now, now Jack, who just played um, this excerpt, he was playing low horn, he was playing second horn. And um, I think at, at his age uh, in the National Youth Orchestra of America, I wouldn't advise the students to specialize actually at all. I would advise them to be able to play the entire spectrum of the horn because you never know what your first call is going to be. You never know who's going to call and say, um, can you come and play third horn? This is the New York Philharmonic, the Berlin Philharmonic, Vienna Philharmonic. Can you come and play third horn in whatever? And you say, oh, no, sorry, I'm a low horn player. That's not cool. So um, and other way around as well. If, can you come and play fourth horn in Shostakovich five? Oh, sorry, I'm only a high horn player. You'll never get a call again. So I specialized quite late, well, actually, when I got my first job, a second horn in the Berlin Opera. And then I started figuring out the low horn stuff. Um, there's another question I, also from Vincent. Are there any major differences between um, high horn and low horn player in terms of the physicality of playing? Well, low horn, you need a ton of air. You need a lot of air all over the range, but you need to move that air faster in the low range. You have to be very open in your throat and in your chest. Um, very ha, ah, very uh, a baritone bass singer. It has to be very open. Um, physically, you don't have to have as much tension in your lips as if you play the high horn. But um, as I say, I play low horn in the Berlin Philharmonic, but I practice high every day. Stefan Dorr, one of the best horn players in the world, he practices low horn every day. So we try and try and keep it all keep it all going. Um, so uh, I had a nice comment from Alexandra Honigsberg. Hi, Alexandra. Um, he, she said, I wasn't mean to Jack. He's so good that it's worth it to work on such details with him. I absolutely agree. And that's why I get quite picky in masterclasses on tiny details, because if the player is good, then it would be a terrible shame for them to lose an audition because of one of these tiny things. And the people we want getting the jobs are the people that have really worked out all these tiny details. So, for example, playing the Eroica, um, you have to know what the other horn players are doing. That's why it was great that Jack had his, his friends with him to, to play the trio so that when you play it, the second horn part, it doesn't feel so lonely. You can hear what's happening in the music. I loved in the trombone uh, masterclass just now with Dietmar. If you missed it, you can go back and watch it on catch up. He started to sing the, 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 the bass part um, while Jake was playing the tuba mirum. And it's so important to know in orchestral excerpts, when you're going to play them in audition, what's happening around you, um, what the singer is singing, the, the, the text, the notes, what the orchestra is doing. So that would be a really, really important tip. I, I think I, I, I mentioned in the masterclass, but make sure if you're preparing orchestral excerpts, you know everything that's happening around the your particular excerpt. You know who you're playing with, who's got the solo, who's loud, who's quiet, um, who the composer was, why did he compose this piece, what's it all about. You, you just need to know all this stuff because only somebody that knows all that can play an orchestral excerpt in an audition really well. Amen. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so uh, Jesse Robertson said, I just had my private lesson and my teacher recommended listening to, to us here tonight. So perfect timing. That's great. Welcome. Um, John just tuned in and said, great to hear the footage of us working with these young players at Carnegie Hall. Um, mixture of stories, demonstration and brilliant advice. Well, thank you for that. And I'm so glad there's so many of you, someone from the Honduras, uh, David from Costa Rica. Um, uh, Dylan King asked if I ever got to eat at the Carnegie Deli. I did. I couldn't finish anything that was on my plate. I've never seen such huge ports. I think it's closed now, which is a bit of a bit of a shame. Um, uh, John McCutcheon, that was who, who asked that. that. John, great to see you. Venezuela, Emmanuel. Heidi Oris is watching. Really fantastic to see you all here. And Tony's dog Booker was singing with Jack in that excerpt. So while I pause to take a breath, it's uh, not easy to, to talk in a camera for a long time. So thank you for even listening and being here. I decided I didn't want to be alone in this chat anymore. So I've invited a special guest. I thought it would be really interesting to check in with Jack McCammon five years later and see what he's up to. So I wrote to him literally five, ten minutes before this stream started, wrote to him on Facebook, said, Jack, what are you doing? Can you jump in on this chat? And he said, yes. And here he is, Jack, live from New York. Hey. Hello. <laughs> you are such a trooper. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> You literally got the message 10 minutes before we went live, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> um, five years ago. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it feels like such a long time ago. I, I, you know, it's funny because that video remains forever in history at that time. So I have people to this day come up to me saying, oh, you're the kid from that video. You're the kid who played the Beethoven. <laughs> That's great. And what do you remember about that masterclass? I mean, I thought it was a great experience. It was wonderful to play for you, but I remember being very nervous. I think that was a, a big takeaway too, going into it, you know, having that pressure to play not only for you, but also for an audience in a masterclass setting. I, I feel terrible about that because I feel, I know when I go into masterclasses and I see some people so terrified and they think, but it's just me. I'm not scary. Um, I had one one girl in Japan. I, I went in and uh, she came on stage. I said, what are you going to play? I'm saying she went ah, and she started to cry and couldn't play anything. I felt terrible. <laughs> you didn't cry. I'm very grateful for that. Um, but what would your advice be? Because I, I just I try and talk to the people playing, trying to put them at ease because I feel I'm often more nervous than you guys are, because if someone comes in and plays really well, I'm sitting there while you're playing thinking, oh my goodness, they're fantastic. What am I going to say? <laughs> um, so actually, you know, it works both way around as well. Is that any help knowing that or is that not really any help? I, I actually think that that's a lot of help. Um, one of the best pieces of advice that someone's told me is when you play for people, everyone is rooting for you. No one is hoping that, that you do bad, you know. Um, so it, it's actually very comforting to know that everyone really is there on your team rooting for you. Um, which is just one piece that, that does help calm me down now these days before a performance. Yeah. Um, Anne Scherer is watching from the Met Opera Horns. Hi, Anne, in New York. Lovely to see you out there in the chat. Thanks for tuning in. It's so great. I love to see all this. Go what do you think, Jack? Isn't it great? Haven't we got a great community out there of brass players? I think, I mean, it's, it's wonderful that everyone tunes in from all over the world and also, especially during this time period, to have any sort of connectivity, like you said earlier, is just is very important. Yeah. So what are you doing now? So I just finished my um, undergraduate degree at the Curtis Institute of Music, and uh, I just started my master's degree at the Juilliard School in New York. How is that going to work for you this year? Because I, I mean, I know you've got amazing teachers like teachers like Eric and Julie and, and Jen and uh, fantastic teachers. But are you allowed to have live lessons or will it all be on the, the beloved Zoom? Some lessons have been in person, obviously, with extremely safe precautions and everything. But um, the school is working really well to make sure they, they approach things from a safe angle, but um, it's it's kind of a hybrid model, mostly online, but when we can meet, we, we do hope to meet. Yeah. The, the, the masterclass was so long ago, 2015, um, and all three of you were members of the National Youth Orchestra of America. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Were you in some sort of a, a rehearsal phase when we were there? 
So that was actually a little bit after our summer tour. So the way our National Youth Orchestra works is in the summer, we have a tour program um, and we go all over the country or all over the globe. Uh, that summer, we just finished in China. Um, and so this time period of the master class was actually in the fall. So we all got back together and played and it, and it was actually our first time playing together in a, in a long time, a couple months. Oh, I, youth orchestra friendships, there's nothing like them. You will never, I mean, I actually have, there's a, a friend of mine from the National Youth Orchestra of Great Britain who now lives in New York, who played the viola, but we won't hold that against him, John. And I know he's watching tonight. I've just seen him in the chat. Youth orchestra friendships, they last a lifetime, don't they? Yes, they really do. I still talk to people this day. <laughs> Um, I felt in my youth orchestra experience, actually, that's what prepared me for what I do today. I mean, I learned a lot at college and then and then before I got my job. But the youth orchestra experience and the detail um, which the coaches that they worked with us with, these details and this real drilling, um, you know, the National Youth Orchestra of Great Britain, we had two minutes silence before every rehearsal. Can you imagine? You know, <laughs> but but these these experiences, you know, I'm I really am very grateful to all that experience. And I mean, I know you're not long out of that long out of youth orchestra, but um, but I'm sure it's the same sort of feeling that, that you have that you've taken so much out of that experience with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I really think there's an extreme value because you get a real sense of what what the professionals are doing and, and at an extremely high level. And uh, it's it's just so much fun to to be able to really play in an orchestra and be around very much like-minded people yeah. as yourself that's it it's the like-minded people do any of you out there have any of you had similar experiences when i was at school i was considered a total nerd and i'm proud to be a nerd today i'm a horn nerd and i'm proud of it but at school i was the only person playing the french horn and the only person that really wanted to well no there were a few people that were interested in music as a career but I just spent all time practicing and people just thought I was odd and I'd be like, oh, I found this amazing piece by so and so. And they'd be like, what? You know, who's first in the pop, pop charts this weekend? And and it was only on a Sunday evening when I had orchestra rehearsal that I really felt like accepted and, and understood. Did you have any of that, Jack? Yeah, I mean, I, I went to a public school and not many people like knew that I was in band and it was a huge part of my identity. but. You know, I was just doing my schoolwork and that stuff. But, you know, as soon as I got to these youth orchestra settings and NYO, it's like I could feel like I can finally be myself and, and really express like such a passion that I had for, for my instrument. And on another another hangout or live stream, we'll we'll talk about uh, all the things we get up to that we shouldn't do. I remember climbing off the roof in the middle of the night uh, to meet everybody. We didn't do anything. We just sort of hung out, but, you know, still climbing off the roof. In the middle of the night. Anyway, I hope none of the coaches of the NYO of Great Britain are watching because uh, I might get in trouble now about that. Um, there's been a couple of lovely comments about master classes. Alexandra Honigsberg said, sometimes it's not so much nerves in a master class, but wanting to play really well for everyone because you love them and the music so much. Um, it's that wanting to perform and not wanting to disappoint. That, that, that also plays a big part in it, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I really feel that, especially when like a family member may come. Um, and it's, it's really hard to kind of to trust yourself and just trust that you will give your best product. And, um, you know, something that's always helped me also with that is, is really losing myself in the music um, and, and really hearing what's going on around me and trying to imagine that I, I am playing in the concert hall and, and doing what I love. I say that to students quite a lot, you know, just get into the music and some of them get it, some of them don't. What has been your best way of finding that way into the music and lose? I've played the best when I'm not thinking about myself. You know, that that's I think all of us have had that experience. You know, once you can get the yourself out of the way, I'm tired. My mouth is dry. I'm nervous. My hands sweaty. My knees are shaky. You know, to get that out of the way is quite a big deal. You know, have you had any magic tips along the way? I mean, there, there's a ton of breathing exercises that probably you and I, I both know and, and just calming your heart rate down. But uh, in terms of just losing yourself in the music, I've really found it very helpful to just open your ears and, and really try to listen. And, and, you know, maybe you look in the score beforehand or 
you, you hear recordings and you know that one melody or that one line that happens before you play it. And you really, you know, tune in on that and, and listen to it. And you'll be surprised that you kind of just calm down. You know, you become part of a larger product. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. There, there, there's some, there's so many, this is a whole subject for a whole nother live stream. Um, today's about orchestral brass. Um, there's been a nice question for you um, from Mark Troy. He's planning on auditioning for the NYO. Any tips on the preparation for it? So Jack, tell us what, what did you, how did you prepare for it and what is required for the NYO? So the requirements are you have to you know, make video auditions. So you record a solo and then often three or four orchestral excerpts. And, and my best advice would be to, to really put in your all in, in making the best recordings possible and, and taking a lot of time to do that. Um, you know, it's, it's very important to have a very high quality and really listening to the, what you're, the music you're playing. Um, because as we saw in these master classes, when people are listening to your takes, they want to get a good concept that you know what's happening in the orchestra. So if you play the orchestral excerpt, really understanding the music around you, that will really show through on these audition tapes. Um, and I'm sure Sarah can talk about that as well. Well, we just did a little bit and there's been some questions about that. Um, Peter asks, how important do you think it is for an orchestral player to know what's going on in the full orchestral score? It's vital. It's absolutely vital. And this is why these youth orchestra um, uh, weeks and, and, and tours and, and sessions are, are fantastic because you get to get into these pieces in absolute detail. I mean, I literally knew everybody's part after a three week NYO course and and the pieces I played in NYO when I play them today in the Berlin Phil, it's like I know what they're doing over there and I feel like telling them that they're doing a wrong note. Of course, of course, you have to know when to speak up and when not. Um, but uh, it's really it's vital to know what's going on. And you're absolutely right in an audition tape. Um, or a per, uh, audition in person, the jury hears if you know what's going on around all these excerpts. So uh, I, I noticed something in the three excerpts we had tonight, the three masterclasses. And if any of you have missed the masterclasses, um, you can go back and watch this on the replay. Um, the, uh, the Vienna Philharmonic colleagues, they made their students stand for the orchestral excerpts. And I let you guys sit down because in America, you always sit down for orchestral excerpts, right? And in Europe for auditions, you always stand. So um, yeah, I've never stood for Eroica actually, to be honest, but, uh, but it's true, isn't it? You sit down for orchestral excerpts. Yeah, it is. And it's really true. And, and I've taken a couple of professional auditions myself and, you know, they have a seat there ready for you to, to sit down and play your excerpts. And I know some people stand for their solo, then later will sit down for their excerpts. That's personally my choice, but I do think there, there's good things about both, both options. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to get back to all of you who are writing in on the Facebook platforms and live on YouTube. It's fantastic to see you. I'm a little bit like, um, yeah, look, Jack, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is Carnegie Hall and this is my page on Facebook. There are some fantastic things. Tiffany says thank you for students learning from home. Um, and uh, ah, Blagoja is watching. He has a great budgie that likes to sit on his horn while he's practicing. Um, he's from Macedonia. Phil Mesa says shout out to the U Houston Houston Youth Symphony alumni. Shout out. Who's Houston Youth? That's hard to say. Houston Huth. Um, uh, Nuno says hi from Portugal, At Atli says hi from Iceland, um, Nancy hi from Louisi Louisiana, um, Jimmy from Peru. Isn't this fantastic? What do you think of all that? It is. It's just wonderful to see all these people from all over. <laughs> it's really great. Thank you all so much um, for joining us tonight. Um, we've had a great time uh, presenting this, uh, this special live stream. Jack, it's been fantastic to have you as our special guest. And I think we should gather some alumni and some current members of the NYO USA and, and do, a, do, a, do something about youth orchestras because it's such an important time. So maybe I can, I'll give you a little bit more notice next time because literally guys, <laughs> I asked Jack to come on this 10 minutes before we started and the wonderful Carnegie Hall team said, uh, okay, and they made it happen. <laughs> yes, thank you again for having me and, and thank you for all those listening too. It's really and great. Jack, check out the chats. They're a little bit, the NYO USA page has got some going on on it as well. The Carnegie Hall chat, my page, check them out and see what all your fans are saying because they also really enjoyed your playing as I did back then, all those years ago.
Thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. Lovely to see you. Take care. Stay healthy. And um, yeah, we'll see you soon. are doing these wonderful special live stream events, um, keeping the music out there for you in these strange times. Um, I know uh, there's there's this difficult starting concerts in the States right now in Berlin. We've started concerts again um, for a smaller audience, for a smaller orchestra on the stage. Everyone's being very careful. I'm sick of wearing these masks, aren't you? But we have to wear them. Um, and let's just hope for better times very soon. I've been very honored to host this evening this evening. I hope you've had a great time. Sorry we didn't get to all of the questions. I'm going to go and check out as many as I can now. And if I can, I'll answer them briefly for you. If you tune in next week here live on Facebook and YouTube on the Carnegie Hall Facebook pages, um, you will hear the, a very special masterclass by the amazing Joyce DiDonato. And um, you'll be hearing some special comments um, just for you. She'll be presenting this same time, same place next Wednesday, live, live from the Carnegie Hall. Um, we're bringing the music to you. It's been fantastic that you joined us. Thank you to the whole team at Carnegie Hall for putting this on. It's been wonderful to feel a part of your team all the way over here in Berlin. I'll say good evening from here. Lots of love to you all who you who've been watching and um, stay healthy out there and listen to a lot of music. We need it right now. All the best. Take care. Bye bye.